Warmest greetings to all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, what is your reputation among friends, in church, at your workplace, in your school? What is your reputation? God does expect us to have a reputation. Because if you turn to Philippians chapter 4, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 is our focus. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Be known unto all men. We must be known well for something as Christians in this world to all men. Let it be known. If after you die, and you have eulogies. What would people come up to say about you and I? What will be we what will be we really be known known for? Will it be known among all men that we are people of moderation? So we must ask ourselves, what is moderation then? What is moderation? Now this word is not something that is used anymore as a common way in the, in the modern English. In the modern English, it is your moderation. People often, often think like, don't eat so much. Eat in moderation, right? Don't, um, don't oversleep. Sleep in moderation. Everything done in moderation. But to some extent, it, it has that meaning of restrain. Restrain, all right? Restrain. This word... In other parts of scripture, now one of the translations of this word is gentleness. All right, gentleness. This is more the meaning of this word. One who is forbearing, one who is meek, also used to refer to our Savior, his meekness. Now, of course, you need self restraint to be so, to be gentle, to be forbearing. To be humble, you need to restrain the flesh. Hence, you know, the word moderation. Now, why would the translators not just simply translate it like other places as gentleness? Because now, this is an outward action of gentleness that God wants us to focus on. So the King James translators, they are very accurate, precise in their nuances of using the English word. Why some places they use gentleness? Why some places they use moderation, that restraint? Why? Because of verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. We learned that last week. You see, rejoicing is an emotion, a response from within you. It's something that happens inside you. You may be rejoicing in a sense, and people do not really know, all right? But here, now the emphasis, well, you can say gentleness, but the emphasis is an outward, outward response that people can see. That is why it is about let it be known. God did not say, let your rejoicing be known. That can be inside you. But when it comes to gentleness, your self-restraint, let it be known. Seen your self restraint, let it be seen. That is why it is a very good translation. When you understand, when you read the Greek, you will, you will know what, what God is trying to emphasize from the context, and he used a very good word. Now, if you say, Lord, I want at my funeral for people to come up and say, This was a gentle man, a gentle lady. I want to be known among my colleagues, among my friends in church, among my um, schoolmates, that I am one that is moderate. What does it mean exactly? What does it look like? Now, to break down this word more, 
So he said, Lord, I must learn this, right? You want me to be known for this. So let me pay attention, Lord. Show me. Now, it is one that is big-hearted. Big-hearted. Because this word has this focus on not insisting, not insisting in your right, on your rights. All right? So something... Someone infringed on your right. Yet you are very big-hearted, very gentle still. You don't fight with them. You don't get irritated with them. Still very gentle in spirit. All right, so you try to imagine. Now, words are very important, right? God chose certain words, so we must understand the words so we know how to behave. So don't be disinterested. So this big-heartedness. Are you a big-hearted person? Or are you always, in every situation, fighting for your way? Or are you always like, go ahead, go ahead, it's okay, go ahead. Big hearted. Thinking in consideration of others, that is what it reflects. Christ was like that. Christ did not come to do his will, have his way. He came to save others. He came to live for us, die for us. This consideration, this big heartedness towards all, even his enemies. Now, this big heartedness, this gentleness, is not just something that, well, you know, you just show, but it is a reluctance to be in conflict. In other words, you're big hearted because you do not want conflict, you want peace. You do not want to be the cause or when there is conflict to contribute to it. You want to solve conflict. Now it is no, no um, surprise, right? Look at verse 2. I beseech you, Adias, and beseech in take it, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he says, Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. He says, you are dying. Can you please learn this? Be big hearted. Don't keep fighting for your own way. Be of the same mind. Means, can you please put aside your, your own desires and your own ways and your own will and your stubbornness? Can you please put it aside and be one mind with the other? Put, in other words, bend. Yes, this may be your right, but can you bend? Be big-hearted and bend to someone else. Now, let's be very clear. Paul is not talking about bending to doctrinal errors, all right? He has dealt with that already, about the false teachers, about not budging at all with the, against the false teachers to expose them. In chapter 3, verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision, right? He warned. He's not talking about bending and be big-hearted to doctrinal errors. But he's talking about all this interpersonal relationship issues. You see, rejoicing can be situations. Well, whatever situation, I rejoice. That's good. I hope you learn that. In all situations, count your blessings. When, you're, when you can't rejoice, and say, well, this thing happened. But really, it could be worse. Or think of all the good things that I have in my life compared to others. I count my blessings, I rejoice, right? There can be something, a situation, but now it is about people. See, we can be rejoicing people, but we can be still difficult people to get along with. So here, God deals with them. So it's a willingness to yield your way to others, to give up your own right. Now, it is a, it's, it's an inclination. So God says, let your moderation be known to all, all men. Let it be known that you're a person who's, who's very inclined to be considerate, to think of other people's need first and be willing to give up your way and bend to theirs. Put, put others first. It's just like you're queuing up. Queuing up and then someone cuts in front of your queue. And then the person say, can you please, please let me go first? Because my child is very sick, you know. I really need to quickly get this. 
You were carrying a lot of things. He said, just I'm by just one thing. Is it your right not to let the person in? Of course, you have been in the queue. But you see, it is this big-heartedness, this consideration for others. Christians must be known to be like that. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Or are you going to say, what, this is my right? You queue as like everyone else, go to the back. So it is this kind of spirit. We'll see more examples, God willing, afterwards. But what about contending for the faith? And we're asked to call for con- to contend for the faith. When it comes to that, yes, we must contend earnestly, fight, and not let people um, distort the truth and we well, be big-hearted, keep quiet. No, Paul does not say that. God does not say that. But in contending for the faith, we do not need to be contentious, personally contentious. But there's this, this heart in you, this gentleness, this meekness that you want the other person, this compassion in you, the other person to come to know the truth. All right, not a contentious spirit and try to... F- contentious means you want to win the battle, that's all. You want to win and make, make sure people know you are right, that is all. No, it's not that kind of spirit. All right? So, this forbearing, this making allowance for others, not standing on your right. Um, and if you need to, all right? So please, I'm not saying that you must always give, give way. In some cases, you cannot give way, all right? You may have your needs, genuine needs. Where you can, you do. Now, in, even in when you cannot, when you cannot, for genuine reasons, do so with a meek and gentle spirit. That is what it means. All right? It doesn't mean that you absolutely always have to give way, give in. And, but sometimes you may need to not give way. Then you still can be known for moderation, known for self-restraint in how you deal with it. Then people say, you know, when this person, I understand that this person actually cannot yield, all right? It has been unreasonable for me to expect this person to yield. But wow, the way the person responds, wow, Christians are different, all right? It's not this cold, careless, but they, they think of how to help you understand why they cannot. All right, that is what Christians should be known for. So let me ask you, at your workplace, are you like that? Are you like that? Are you always calm, collected? When there's great pressures in life, when people sabotage you, the very person that sabotages you, how do you respond to this person? Let me ask you, how? Retaliate? Fight back? God says, no, 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 no. That is not what you should be known for. That is what you have been before salvation. What do you do? You continue to be gracious. You see, sometimes in the workplace, people, they see, they know what is the truth. They know that you are being bullied. But, but they see this Christian, the way he responds, this gentleness, this meekness, this carefulness with words, yet gracious all the time, actually they will know who is the bigger man, right? Who is the bigger man? The one who can control his emotions, control his responses. That is the bigger man. You see, that is the reputation that Christians ought to be known for. But most of us will say, fight back! Make sure I don't give an inch. What? It's my chance to get back at him and and do all these things. We think that that is being strong. No. You see, that is the thing about, about the Christian life. God says, being weak in the eyes of the world, so to speak. Right? Being gentle is weak in the eyes of the world. Is when you are strong. Now, the workplace, are you someone who is known? Known. Known to be looking out for others. You know, I have some colleagues who are like that. Some are like the big brother, all right? Always thinking of others and trying to make sure that everything is peaceful and 
And when he does something, he thinks of the other department. They're like the big brother. But there are some who are very selfish, very self-centered. But some, they are, they are willing to yield. Ah, I see. I understand why the department needs it in this situation. Let's, 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 let's let them have it first. All right? That is that kind of attitude. But it is contrary to how the world functions. So you see, when the Christian behaves like that, you are, you are someone that shines as a light. Different. At the workplace, when you're maligned and falsely accused, how do you respond? Now, I'm not saying you cannot speak up. God is not saying that you cannot respond. But watch your response. That is the key thing. The Apostle Paul is not just speaking words. He lived this out. Isn't it true? He's in prison for no fault of his own, but people malign him. He's in prison because he's not an apostle. That's why God is punishing him. He's not good a preacher. That is why God put him aside. All sorts of maligning. Paul knew it is not true. But yet his response was, if God's word is preached, I rejoice. If, they, if God used them to further truth, I rejoice. You see, there's no this bitterness and so on. If someone wrong you, malign you, learn to respond in moderation, gentleness, meekness, the right spirit. Now, what about in life? Hmm, young people or elderly also. People look down on you. You feel that you did not get the respect that you want. A very common thing, especially for elderly. Like, as you grow old, you feel that the respect that is due to you, and I'm not saying there isn't, must be there. And then if someone did not give it to you or, or accidentally did not. See, the pride in us, the normal response is anger. You hold it in your heart. The next time you see, see, never accord me the respect again. See, and everything that person does, you say, see, in your heart. But you see, this gentleness is, is you do not hold these kind of grudges. You say, yeah, it's due to me. I did not get it. Well, so be it. You continue to be gracious to the person. Young people. Being looked down upon. Who make you angry, isn't it? When they say, you're not so smart, you're not so good looking, you're not so clever, you're not so this, you're not so that. You, you did come from a rich family like me. Then if you feel that, wow, then you get angry. Now God says the Christian's response in all this is one that you just, you, just, you, you don't get worked up by it. You continue to be friendly to them, helpful to them. Now that is what you should be known for. Let it be known. Now, what about this very big issue today? Racial profiling. Huh? You go to a restaurant, then you feel that, you know, because of my skin color, they always put me in the corner table. Because of my skin color, what? they always serve the other skin color first. All right? We have all these kind of imaginations, maybe true, maybe not, but whatever the case, we may face these things, really, in life. Just because Paul was an apostle, just because he's a Christian, he faced religion profiling, so to speak, by the Jews, even by the Romans. He faced those things. But he always still cared for them, loved them, responded gently to them, wanted them to come to know, to know the Lord. So whatever, even if people look down on you, God says, let your response show them that you're like Christ. I think this is common. On the road, men, maybe women as well. When you are on the road, your driving is your right of way. Someone cuts into your lane. What is your response? Before you want to hit the horn and wave your hand at the person and show your angry face, remember what the Christian ought to be. Our response is one of gentleness, 
one of, well, you go first. You go first. Your immediate response in your heart, maybe, maybe the person has an emergency. Maybe the person had a, or someone upsets you when you're talking and then the person cut in. Or when someone does something that irritated you. Maybe the person did not intend. Your heart just say, well, maybe the person have a hard day, have a bad day. He wasn't thinking and, and just did that. It's not directed at me. See, this gentle, this, this, um, this big-hearted spirit, that is what we should be. Now, if you and I have been people that, that are like that, I think all of us are prone to that. Even when someone tries to be nice to us, and I will say that we are always very guilty of that. Very often in our hearts, we have to confess, Lord, sorry. Trying to be nice to us, we misinterpret their actions because we are not people that are gentle. We imagine evil of others all the time. Very guilty of that. Christ, Satan is always the accuser of the brethren. That is why we always have accusing thoughts. Be careful of that, all of us. Right? From the pastor to the congregation member, every time we realize that, confess and repent. I like what someone shared. The mother was very worried about his stomach when he was having a Zoom meeting or whatever online meeting with a the, with the company. Then the mother knocks open, you need food? See, we feel like, why do you interrupt me? Don't you know I'm busy? Why are you always like that? Well, I thank God the, the young person said, I was so ashamed after that. I learned. Now, this is what it is. This is always thinking of, of responding in a grateful way, thankful way, gentle way. Young people, young ones, daddy and mommy just scolded you this morning. But you know you were not guilty. <laughs> your sister or your brother was the one. How do you feel? Angry, fed up, show face to your parent, come to church upset, fuming, shout back. Why is it always me? Why do you think it's always me? Maybe at work also your boss picks on you and says, why are you always speaking on me? But God says, well, let your moderation be known. God is talking about exactly that. God is saying you will face this kind of situation in life as a Christian, then behave as a Christian. As a Christian, you're no different from unbelievers. You will face these things too. Don't think just because you have Christian parents, they are perfect. They never scold you wrongly. They never have the wrong accusations. They are perfect. No, only Christ can rule like that. So when these things happen, teens... See, I am a Christian. I learn today. My classmates, they respond like that. But I'm a Christian. I respond differently. Yes, you need to explain yourself to your parents or to your spouse or to your... Right, spouse. It's a typical thing that we say, right? Why do you always say it's me? Why do you always think it's me? Why do you... That kind of behavior, right? Now, even if it were true, that your mommy or your spouse accused you falsely, misunderstood the situation. Respond in moderation. Respond gently. Daddy and mommy, no, no, it's not me. Honest to God, I did not do it. You know, that would probably make your daddy and mommy feel very embarrassed. And daddy and mommy, then you must be gentle also. Don't put up a front. Wow, wow, I made a mistake. Huh? But daddy and mommy cannot make a mistake, right? Hmm. Next time, don't make me think it's you. <laughs> it's still your fault. Don't. You also be big-hearted and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. Because it's very common between spouses as well. Christians, be gentle, meek in your response. Because sometimes your spouse say, oh, you, you don't want to go, right? You, you don't, right? Then you think, but no, I really want to go. But why are you saying that? Because of maybe some historical thing, you respond gently. 
The Christian in the home is to be different from every other home. When visitors come, when they hear about how you, how you talk to each other in the car, they must see the difference. You don't say, why, is it, why, why do you say I don't want to go? You say, oh, no, no, it's, it's not so, dear. I, I, I really want to go. It's, I don't know why you think that way. It's a gentle response. That is how. We, that is what we must be. And as we get older, very often that is difficult. That is very difficult. But let me remind seniors, as you get older, means you have less time on earth to be what God wants you to be. That is the most important time that you change. In church, this is what has been happening. Eudias and Sinteke demanding, expecting, fighting, getting upset when either one of them did not get their way. It's obviously not a doctrinal problem. Otherwise, Paul would dealt with it opening, openly. It's obviously some personal ways. Now, when... Or well now... Maybe another aspect, another aspect. You serve in church. Share the last aspect. You serve in church. The pastor misunderstood, or the deacons misunderstood you and rebuked you, falsely, wrongly accused you of not doing something or having done something. How do you respond? Is it one of gentleness and no, no, you know, pastor or no, you know, deacon so and so? No, 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 this was not what happened. Are you a person that is known to be like that? Or are you known to be a person, and I've seen this kind in churches? You know, I don't have to serve in church, you know. I'm not paid, you know, like you. It always goes back to salary. I'm not paid, you know. I'm doing this out of charity, you know. You falsely accuse me? You, you think I'm not that good? Okay, I resign. I don't do it anymore. You go find someone else to do it. There are many kinds, many times these things happen. But God says, be open-hearted, be, be, be forbearing, be understanding, be patient. Now, if Christ behaved like that, I come to die for you, and you call me having the spirit of Satan, my arch enemy, I come and, and do all this for you, and you're not even appreciative. You malign me, you accuse me. Ah, forget it. I'm going to abandon work of salvation. You see, that is why this word is applied to Christ. That long-suffering, that, that patience, even as we do God's work. There have been times, even in this church, I've seen it in other churches, even in this church, just because someone did not like, not even misunderstood, did not like something, did not suit his taste. And we need the person in the committee. There was some misunderstanding of what happened. Just simply don't do it. Just simply don't even call the ministry lead. Just don't turn up and stop doing it. It actually has to do with our church bulletin. Just simply stop, because I'm not happy. And other ministries as well, needed. You see, if we behave like that in church, and often we will behave like that because we think that Christians of all the people should not be like that. That is why we behave like that. We think parents of all the people should not be like that. We think children of all the people should not be like that. Are we because of that? Because it's be big-hearted. Be big-hearted. Be forbearing. Now, I'm not saying, like we learned on Friday, eh? I'm not saying tolerate sin and ignore it and don't deal with it. But there's gentleness, there is forbearing, there is patience. All right? Errors do happen. Now, then we ask the next question. Why is this important? Because we said, look at chapter 4. 
He begins by saying, So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. This has to do with standing fast, hence the title today. Stand fast in your moderation. This has to do with stand fast, being standing fast in the Lord. So why is it important? Well, the first reason is this. This is our reputation. This is the reputation of Christians. Let your moderation be known. This is what we are supposed to be known for. Why is it important? We are to stand fast in this kind of behavior. That is what we are supposed to be characterized to be. At home, your children must see that in you. Your parents must see that in you. In church, as we serve, as we live with one another, that is what must be known about us, especially in the working world and in the school, in your neighborhood. Your neighbor did something wrong, accidentally maybe the, the dustbin spilled, spilled over to your side. Then you wait, 3 a.m. I will go and talk to them at 3 a.m. 3 a.m., ding dong, to irritate them because they irritate me, right? All this kind of behavior. Right? Just gently sweep it up, put it, put it aside for them. If it keeps happening, then write a note or talk to them gently, meekly. I see this even in unbelievers, you know. One of my neighbors, they moved out, they rent, temporarily rent a home, and they had a big family. So their dustbins are always overflowing. And then at night they will come, creep to the neighbor's house, and use other people's dustbins, and they are also overflow and flow, flow everywhere. Then this neighbor came up to me and said, you know, you know this family, um, because I think he thought it might be me, so I have to explain. So he said, you know, they have a big family, and I can understand they don't have enough dustbin space. I intend to tell them to, that they can write to council to ask for bigger bins and more bins in their situation. You see, even unbelievers behave with moderation. And I was thinking, wow, this is an unbeliever. And you have this big-heartedness, this gentleness, this consideration, this understanding spirit. That is what we should be. Now, where was I? Back to why. That is what we are known to be. We must stand fast in this, all right, Christian? If you have not been such a person, if I as a pastor have not been such a person, I must learn because we are supposed to be known to be that. Yes, sometimes people will misunderstand us. I'm not asking you to please men to the point where you compromise and you always please men. I'm not saying that. Sometimes there are things that you cannot help it, all right? When you serve the Lord. But by and large, when it's personal, personal offenses, be known for that. So that's the reason, number one, that is our reputation. God wants us to be that. Whatever age, all right? Now, number two, if you and I do not exercise restraint, moderation, we will behave sinfully. We will behave sinfully. And when you behave sinfully, responding in frustration, in hostility, fighting, a few things will happen. Number one, well, of course, your testimony will be gone. Testimony will be gone. Whether it's in church, a small offense, and you blow up in the church, what will happen? That is what Satan wants. Your reputation to be someone who's like that. When you respond in hostility, in frustration, your usefulness will be gone. You behave like that at work. Then you share the gospel. Your colleagues will snigger in their heart. This is the most hypocritical religion. They talk about their meek God. They're nothing like their religion. This must be false. Their religion did not change them. Why would I want to believe in it? I've seen unbelievers better than him or her. You become useless. That is why Satan wants you. React like that. He will fan. React like that. Go ahead, go ahead. You will feel good after that. 
Yes, you may feel good. You shouted and screamed at the person and then you walk out of the room. Hmm, I got back at the person. Or walk out of church. Hmm, I got back at the person. But after that, your heart will convict you. And you realize you believe you, you acted so foolishly. You embarrass yourself, you embarrass your family, embarrass your Lord most and foremost. Right? He wants you to act like that so that you become useless. You are dyers and sinteke. They were pleaded to, be more, to exercise moderation. Why? Because this other reason is you will destroy ministries. Not only you become useless, this, pers- this two person arguing, fighting, has made it difficult for people to work in the church. Between ministries, there are frictions. Between people, frictions. To the point where you say, cannot use this person, cannot use that person, cannot put these two persons in the same committee. Ministries will be affected. Very soon people will resign from the ministry because the person said, I cannot take it anymore. I can't work with this person, pastor. Unreasonable. Unyielding. Without understanding. Un- without rational. Without rationing. Can't be reasoned with. Pastor, I cannot serve anymore. So you destroy ministries. You not only destroy yourself. Then, of course, I mentioned earlier, why is this so important for your standing fast? If you and I do not learn to be like that, we'll be like those pers- people that, we, that I mentioned. When we face aggravations, misunderstandings, or false accusations, mis- out of not intentional um, words, we stop serving. The great privilege of serving the living God, you throw it all away. To make yourself feel good. Now I teach them a lesson. See? This means you're in trouble, right? Without me. See, not enough people, right? You will act like that and throw away the eternal privilege, eternal rewards of serving God. It's very foolish, but it feels good for a short time. Not acting in moderation. All right, that is the why. Your stability of your walk and service and your testimony and your bringing up of godly seed and your walk as a single all boils down to this. Self-control. To be gentle, meek, understanding, big-hearted, even if you're offended, even if it's unfair. Paul was like that. Never give up. Never give up. Now then, we move quickly. To whom should we be like that? Look at chapter 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known to those that you like. Let your moderation be known to those that is easy for you to be moderate with. No. Let your moderation be known to all men. You see, it is easy for us to... Be nice to those who don't rub against you in church, at work. Don't get on your nerves. It's easy to be big-hearted, to be persevering, to be long-suffering, to be patient. It's easy to be like that with the child that is very obedient, not the other child who is always so playful and so naughty, mischievous. But say, oh, men, it is easy for us to work with a reasonable Colleague, an understanding boss, and you will be understanding also. Because it's all men, even to the unreasonable boss. It is easy to be, a, to be so to a helpful colleague, to be so with a nice classmate, schoolmate, project mate. But it's also to those that are rude, sabotaging towards you. God says all men, all men, at home, in church, there will be some difficult ones. But God says all men. You know, some people say, oh no, the person is very nice. Are we talking about the same person? Are we like that? 
Are we like that? I think you're not talking about the same person. No, it's so and so. Because we don't have a reputation to be sold to all men in all situations. What about service provider? We go out and we give out tracts to evangelize. Maybe you book a table, you turn up, the table was given to someone else. How do you behave? It's not like there's no other tables. How do you behave? Are you deaf? Are you stupid? Don't you see that the telephone number and my name, that table is mine? This is how we behave, how we naturally behave. Why are you just because my skin color is this, is it? You see, we jump to all these things because we don't have an open-heartedness, a broad-mindedness a, a broad about things. Oh, you sit down, you order, and then they forget your order, and then the other tables keep getting, you're hungry, you're late. Can I see your boss? What kind of restaurant is it? Are we like that? Now, I'm not saying that you cannot respond and say, can I please talk to your, your supervisor? You know, I'm in a hurry. I really need my food now. Or maybe you pack it for me, all right? Not respond to retaliate. In fact, this word is non-retaliatory. You, you are not, you don't have an inclination, you do not have a desire to cause a scene. That is what it means. You always want to not cause a scene as far as you can. To whom? People who neglected you, did not give you the re respect, and so on, all right? Social media, behind the computer, behind writing emails, behind, you know, in person, we, we won't speak like that normally, but whoa, the moment is email, the moment is social media, we let loose, right? We let them have it. That's what the world say. Before you type, before you click send, before you click post, open this verse and say, let your moderation be known to all men. Even those that malign, attack, make fun of you. Let your moderation be known to all men. Now, in fact, when you are like that, you have a much better spirit. This broad-heartedness, while people in the world think it's counterintuitive, it is not to the believer. When you choose to be like that, you actually are a much happier person. You see, sometimes you sit at restaurants or you see family argue and say, it's such a small thing that is easily resolved. Why do they want to put themselves to that stress, that anger, that heart rate going up, blood pressure going Why do they want to do that? Happens in the home all the time, right? Even in parenting. It's better for your health. Destroy your health, you can't serve God. It's not just for your health only. Now, but then, the last question is this. Lord, how can I be like that? Because I'm not like that. I just did that this morning at home. I just responded like that this week at work. I just behave like that to my spouse. I did that to my Christian brethren in church some time back. Lord, how can I be like that, especially when I'm supposed to be known to be that? Well, the answer is found in verse 4. I'm oh, sorry, verse 5. The second part. The Lord is at hand. You see, the Lord is at hand. That is what Paul tried to tell the Christians. It is not easy, I know, to be like that. I, I go through all these things. I have this welling up of wanting to react badly. But Christian, the Lord is at hand will help you. The question is, what is the Lord is at hand? What is the Lord is at hand? Now, number one, the Lord is at hand means remember the presence of the Lord. He's, he's at hand. We like to pray, Lord, please be at hand to help me. Lord, let your presence always, you know, comfort and cheer me and be close to me. We pray that, right? Remember if, when you remember the presence of the Lord, you control your lips, you control your tongue, you control your behavior, 
You control your anger. And say, Lord, this is not what you want to be, me to be. I remember that you say that. So, Lord, I'm going to behave like that. Oh, Lord, you're here. Now, you know, when I was a student, I had a, I had a classmate. We went, went to study overseas together. And we have to open bank accounts. And then he chose this bank, which promised uh, a catalog of things. If you open an account with us, these are the things you can choose. So he said, I want to go to that bank. I said, all right, up to you. Then he banked with that bank, all right, open account. Then when he chose things, the bank said, not available. Next one, not available. Then for weeks, he chose one. A few weeks later, not available, not available. He was upset, angry. So he said, I'm going to call them up. I said, okay, okay. His English wasn't very good. So I said, I'll come with you, you know. So, you know, you have to go, not like now, you pick up handphone. You students are rich and all that, have your own handphone, your own SIM card. In, for us, we go to a telephone booth, this red, smelly, cold telephone booth. Squeeze inside, all right? Use coins and make sure you have enough coins. That's how we live, all right? So, you students, you should be thankful and not complain. No reception, poor reception, so speed. Right? We use coins. Now, when he says, I have to, to explain to this person. Now, then he, he pushed me out of the, out of the, of the, of the telephone booth. Very angry. You go out, you go out, you go out. I said, why? I'm just trying to help you, you know? Maybe I can help explain better. No, you go out. I said, why? I'm going to scold them. I'm going to say things that I don't want you to hear. <laughs> His English was not very good, but you know, after you go through the army, even your English is not very good. You have many vulgar languages that you're very good at. He was going to let them have it. But he knew my presence. And he knew I was a Christian. I've been evangelizing to him. He knew my presence. I'm not even Christ, all right? He just know I'm a Christian and Christians should not behave like that. He don't want to offend me. He, he don't want to shame, embarrass himself. He just don't want another person hear him behave like that. So he keeps saying, you go away. I'm going to say things that I don't want you to hear. You see, the Lord is at hand, knowing the presence of our God and what He is and what He wants us to be will make us stop. We say, I don't know how. Practice that. Keep practicing that. In the car, when you want to slam your horn, uh, the Lord is next to me. <laughs> when you want to scold the service provider, the Lord is in this conversation. You know that, that poster, right? God is the head of this house, the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. Practice that. If you don't have, go to a shop, buy that. Order one online. Put it in your home. Because outside we may behave like that, more because we don't embarrass ourselves. But at home, it's different. How was it like during quarantine? Let me ask you. Quarantine time. How was it like? At each other's neck? Or, that you're mod or exercising moderation. Siblings differing one to another. I shared this before, I'm not sure whether in worship. I watched two child in church order food at a dinner. The older child wanted to eat something. Right? She asked a few times, what about this? What about this? They were going to share food. The younger child didn't seem very interested. Then the older child said, hmm. the child can sense then flip the page. What about this one? Then they discuss. It was such an interesting and heartwarming um, to watch. They discuss with each other. Then the boy said, then the young one said, maybe this one. And then the one said, but um, maybe. So they discuss. You see, there's this consideration. There's this moderation. And the older one was ready to give in to the younger one. And then finally, the younger one somehow chose what the older one wanted. And the older one was very happy. But the older one did not say, yeah, that was for that one. She, I could just tell that the older one was happy. But ready. You see, that is how it begins at home, within spouses, between parents, between children. This is what the Christian home is supposed to be. Your relatives, your friends, you evangelize to them. But what do they see do they see Christ-likeness in you, in your meekness, gentleness, and consideration for others? If you are like that, oh, the power of 
your evangelism. You know, some people say, I want to be a Christian. You ask them why? Because I see Christians' homes. I just want to have homes like that. So this is what it means. Practice that. Practice that. The presence of the Lord. Now, the second thing is this. The Lord is at hand. It's about, besides the presence, it's about the perspective of eternity. The perspective of eternal. The Lord is at hand also talks about His soon coming. He can come anytime. And therefore, all these Losses that you suffer, all this defrauding that you suffer, all this persecution, all this maligning, all this mistreatment that you face, all this irritation that you face, now all this will soon be gone. Have a perspective. You know, sometimes when, when in the office you see people arguing, arguing, and then the boss will in, hey, come on, guys, can you have a perspective of things? Then all of a sudden say, oh yeah, actually, it's not worth arguing about perspective of the coming eternity. Whatever you suffer now, so be it. Let it aside. You see, when you have that perspective, my reward is in heaven. This response that I have is what God will commend me for. Not my, my irritated response on earth. I may feel good, but I will be not commended for that in heaven. Oh, that eternal perspective. Lord, I want to be like that now. It's not worth fighting over these things. I, I lose my job unfairly. Well, then so be it. You have allowed it. But I will be in heaven in time. My, my, what I gather is for heaven. All this kind of perspective will change how you talk, will shape your perspective of the soon eternity and what it means in eternity will shape your lips, your speech, and your behavior. There's a policy, the Lord is at hand. The perspective will change you. The consciousness of that will change you. But it also means a certain thing that this word brings up that we seldom realize. The Lord is at hand. He did not say Christ is at hand, Jesus is at hand, but he said the Lord is at hand. Now he is he just talked about your heavenly citizenship in chapter 3, verse 21. He is the king of heaven. He is your Lord. He didn't want to say Jesus. He did not say Christ, but Lord. Is Christ coming? Right? We say Christ coming. We said the Lord's coming. You belong to the heavenly king. You belong to the gracious and glorious God who exhibits this kind of behavior although he is the king of heaven. What do I mean by that? Behave like the king of heaven. He is your Lord. Can you please behave like his subjects? Parents, you tell that to your children. Please, don't embarrass our family. Don't shame our family. Then you always remember that. I don't know if throughout this message you're thinking, but Pastor, you know, I keep behaving like that. I'll be a doormat, you know. I'll be walked all over, you know. You see, this is the counterintuitive thing about Christianity. And this is an important perspective. When he said, the Lord is at hand, together with this moderation, he is saying this. True power is not afraid of showing weakness. Your God, your Lord, He is all-powerful. It is the weak that always want to fight for their rights, to show people that they are powerful. He said in chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he talked about Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of servant, and was made like unto the likeness of men. And verse 8, about his humility. You say, understand your Lord. You know, the royalties of countries, 
They are powerful. But the children of the royalties in this world, some of them, they abuse their position. And they want to show, them, show people that they, are, they belong to royalty. They are powerful and they abuse it. But I read in history of some kings, they are all powerful. They can, they can just, you just speak against me, I can put you to death. There are still nations that are like that. But I read of some of these kings in the country. And it's no wonder that the nation, the people love them. Certain generation, the kings are like that. All powerful and children of the all powerful king. But when they go out among the people, they are very humble. They understand they are there to serve. And when people, when, when people accidentally offend them, they are very big hearted. They remember, I have all the power to kill you on the spot. But they remember that they are the son's king. With all the power I have, what shows strength is when I is forbearing, when I am forbearing, when I am big hearted. And when they, when they leave, the people say, wow, you know, that person did that. And he was so big hearted. Wow, wow. What a king. What a son's king. This is what Paul is saying. Remember your Lord, who he is. When, don't think that you, you are a format. Don't think that you are walked over. Rather, realize this. You are the son of the living king. Behave with that magnanimity that Christ showed. Christ, when he was reviled, with all his power, never reviled again. When they crucified and abused him and shamed him, all he said was, Father, forgive them with all the power that Christ had. That is how he behaved. That is your king. Behave like him. That is what bring glo brings glory to him. You can tell people about his love, his gentleness, his forgiveness, but let them see it in you. Because they don't see Christ, they don't read the Bible. But when you behave like Christ, and you tell them, Oh, it's a very powerful message. Do you understand why it is so important for your stability in living the Christian life? My friends, how have we been? All men, treat all men like that. Now, how do you treat someone who has cancer? Hmm? Someone who has cancer. You treat them extra nice, careful, because you know that the person is going to die, right? You're extra kind, extra understanding, even they, they drop things, they get angry at you, you're still very patient. Why? Because you know the person is going to die soon. The Lord is at hand, the last thing I want to say is that. The Lord is at hand means the, our Lord's coming is near. When he comes, he will judge the world. This person that you're so angry with, that you want to retaliate, that you're upset that this person treated you like that, the Lord is at hand. This person is under the condemnation of God. This person will face God's judgment. This person will be in hell forever and ever and ever. It's just like you look at a cancer patient and you understand what this person, what's going to happen to this person. You're extra tolerating extra forgiving, extra accommodating. When God says, the Lord is at hand, you will look at them differently. You will, you will respond with compassion. You will plead with them. You want them to know Christ. And you know that if you react badly to them, you, are, you won't be able to preach the gospel to your parent, to your relative, to your colleague, to your classmate. You may feel good, but every time you think this person... His certainty of his future, he is like a, pers a person who has cancer. He will surely face eternal judgment. You will respond differently when you think the Lord is at hand. So dear Christians, I pray for yourself and definitely for myself. If we have not such a reputation, it's time to change. 
it's time to change. Let us pray. Uh, let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 377. 377. More like the master. Let us rise. 377.